Good morning, TBC. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, come on, please stand and join us for worship. But the first song we're going to sing is Holy is the Lord. You've all heard this one. Um, pretty well. I know it's going to work. So just uh, sing along oh, you can. Sing.
Just whether we're inside or outside. I mean, I like doing things inside, but I love doing things outside. So as soon as the humidity drops at least a few decibels, and uh, we, whatever that's going to be, and our heat drops a little bit, then we'll probably be outside on the platform again, and then you guys can, again, you bring your dog, you tailgate, you do whatever you want. We have a great time out there. And what we've learned uh, over the last couple of months is that more and more people are way willing to be outside than inside. I mean, we have about twice the amount of people that come when we're able to do things outside. And we even had a few Zacchaeus moments. We had a few of your kids climbing trees out there. I'm going to forget one time I'm walking around on the platform. I'm looking out. I'm like, wait a minute. There are two kids in that tree. <laughs> as long as the parents are watching them, doesn't matter to me at all. So it's, it's just, we've had to be innovative as well along the way. So we really appreciate that. That has affected our kids' ministry. Uh, we've gone back to doing things outside for kids every other week, and our next one will be next Sunday. And again, 10:30 service only for that. And we have tents and water. We have plenty of things for kids. Don't care how hot or how cold it is. We may be doing this in December with them outside. You know? <laughs> 
But that's just something we've had to adjust and adapt as well. Each month that goes by, we'll, we'll consider, do we go back in and do kids ministry again? Do we keep it outside as long as we can? Same thing with youth ministry. We try to do a few things online, and that's gone okay. Uh, Amy's going to be starting a ministry for just girls, uh, teen girls, middle school, high school, starting this coming Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Uh, we'll be working with Casey and Tara in the coming weeks to kick things back in the year for overall youth ministry here and in people's homes. I'm thankful for the Numas hosting two events recently for uh, swim parties that have gone very, very well. And uh, we're just you know, we're asking God for wisdom and grace to know exactly how to move forward. There'll be other ministries that we'll be talking to you about as well. We're meeting with a lot of our home group leaders coming up to see how that will go. We'll communicate well with you on that. We're considering doing Sunday school online and in person, but not on Sundays. So we'll let you know how that goes as well, including our foundations course. So again, we'll just keep you posted and we really appreciate you being willing to adjust along the way. Mission updates. We have some missionaries that are stuck here in the United States that can't get back to their country. Dave and Julie Rudolph in South Africa, they're stuck here. The South African government isn't allowing any planes in and out of the Cape Town area, so they're just stuck here, so pray for them. Pray for some of our other missionaries that are actually stuck here, but can't also get back to their nation. And then we have one of our other missionary families, uh, the Maugers. I will keep their uh, location, I will just say, uh, a portion of Asia. Uh, they were not doing well along with several other missionary families with different organizations, and uh, I'm grateful to our government for bringing in some airplanes stealth and uh, basically went in and got our missionaries and several other families out. They flew Amen. the plane into Delhi, they got in, they got our folks out and flew them back, and they have now been on the ground for their two-week quarantine. They are doing very, very well. So I really appreciate some things going on behind the scenes that are working with some of our missionaries. And uh, sometimes when you think that things are going to hell in a handbasket, we hear things like that. And we're just grateful that there are people that are on watch for what's going on. Why don't we have a prayer? And then we'll watch it in God's words. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing here. Thank you, Lord, for just the privilege that it is to worship. I thank you for everybody that's, that's willing to come, whether it's inside, outside, just adjust accordingly in just such really unusual and bizarre uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves. And I pray that we might be willing to consistently and constantly put you first and, and see what you're doing through all of this. Help us to see some of the situations that are going on as, as opportunities to share Christ and, and to live out Christ. And so we pray that you speak to our heart through your spirit as we open up your word today. Blessings on those that are struggling, people that are healing from different ailments, those within our mission community and family that are dealing with various issues as well. Thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, most of you know, for the last uh, almost eight months now, we're in August, we have been working through the book of Jeremiah. And we were in chapter 36 last week, and we learned about the three Bs. Uh, Baruch, Bibles, and burning. And what, what does all of that mean? Uh, Jeremiah was given a word from God. His amanuensis, or secretary, Baruch, communicated that word onto a scroll. And then that scroll was to be given to the king for him to read, and which he did. And what he did was absolutely amazing. He subsequently took the scroll, the word that God had given, and as each page was written and read, he took out, the Bible says, a pen knife, cut the page out of the scroll, and threw it in the fireplace, and burned everything to the ground, if you will, until there was nothing left of the word. Because the platform that he stood on was himself. He wasn't trusting God at all. He wasn't willing to look through the lens of the word to see the world. He was willing to look at himself and then to make judgments on everything else. And that, of course, did not end well for him. God brought Jeremiah back and said, listen, I'm going to do something. I'm going to give you the same thing all over again. I want you to write the exact same thing down, except I'm going to add something to it. And at the very end, and this is recorded at the end of chapter 36, 
The second time around, it said, uh, yeah, the king, Jehoiakim, uh, basically, he's going to burn and rot as a result of what he did to the word. And sure enough, things did not go well for him. And we talked about the platforms that we're standing on. What are those platforms? What are, what are the things in life that you are standing on right now to help you get through this? And even when things are absolutely normal. Are we losing our minds over normal things? Or are we willing to say, okay, God, this, a lot of this isn't really normal. So how do we process it? Uh, Barb had a, just, a, just a gathering with my sister the other night on Thursday. So somebody else from our congregation and I went out and had dinner together. We had a great time. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not anti-mask per se, but I just don't typically wear them. And so I'm used to just going into places. And if they ask me to leave, that's not a problem. I, it's fine. It's their establishment. No problem. So that happened. I went into the, the restaurant. I just walked in like I normally do. And they looked at me like, uh, I don't think so, buddy. And it, it hit me at first. Like, oh, oh, they're actually stopping me midstream. And they're asking. I'm having one of those out-of-body moments in there. Everything is slowing down. And they're saying, you need to leave. It was not a problem. Well, I just said to the person, thank you so much for the way that you approached me on this. This is really appreciative. I'll gladly uh, head outside. Are we able to eat outside? Absolutely. And they said, furthermore, we're going to come out. We'll take your order for you. Uh, we will bring it to your table. We will do whatever you need. And I just, I was very appreciative of that. No problem. So me and this other gentleman, we went down and we just sat and waited around, and then the owner of the establishment came out and spent time talking with us. This was fascinating. Looked at both he and I, and they said, we want you to know how appreciative we are of the way that you handle what just happened. And I said, this is your business. You have every right to do this. This was our responsibility to act accordingly. And they said, no, no, you, you don't understand. We almost had to have the police here twice the night before for people screaming and yelling at us for this whole situation. And I said, well, that's, that's very unfortunate. And I'm sure things are going to be a little crazy for a while. But we were responsibility towards each other. And it gave us an understanding and an opportunity for me and this gentleman that I was with that night to just talk about our platforms. What, what would it have accomplished? If I would have looked at the owner of that business and said, you're out of your mind, you're insane, you bought into this mantra of doing, wait a minute, they're, they're only trying to do the right thing under their, they don't want to lose their business license. They don't want to have somebody tattletailing on them and sending it in. I, I can appreciate that. But I have to tell you, standing on a platform of seeing things through a certain lens gives you an opportunity to, to, instead of reacting, to respond and say, all right, God, what do you want out of this? And that's exactly where we need to be in this area. Because you know what? It may not be a restaurant. It may be going into a, having a hospital procedure. I was talking with somebody at the 9 o'clock service who had a hospital procedure, and it was crazy just getting them into where they're supposed to be and the wait for this, and the, and the adjustments for that. And then afterwards, they prescribed a certain medication, the doctor that was there, and they sent it to a, a pharmacy that was 20 miles away from the pharmacy that they thought they were going to. So then they drove back to the other pharmacy, and then they said that they had no recollection that the doctor even brought it in. How do we handle these kinds of things? Because it's going to be happening if it hasn't happened already. How are we going to handle the craziness when school starts? And your fourth and fifth grade boys that may be going to school are taking off their masks and they're winking them across like rubber bands to the girls sitting next to them. And then hands are going to be raised and then the teacher has to take her, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that. And, oh, oh. I, I mean, this is going to be nuts in the next couple of weeks. And then some of you, right, that are doing the, the dual thing, you're, you're schooling at home, you're, you're schooling in other locations. I mean, this, the stress level is going to continue to mount. What platform are we willing to stand on to allow us to process this, these things effectively 
so that God can be glorified in and through us. And Jeremiah had the same thing going on. I mean, we, we can't possibly begin to think that life was normal for him. Now, he knew a little bit about normal initially. I mean, he was given a commission. He was told that when he was going to obey you. But things were kind of status quo at that point. And then things just began to unravel. I mean, when the other nation of Babylon came in with Nebuchadnezzar as the leadership, and the people were taken and extracted out of their homes, kids were taken from their families. They were given new names, new food, new languages, taken to a completely different area. I mean, that is anything but normal. And yet, he could write in Lamentations. Again, put together, and I, and I know I need a, and this is the first Bible that somebody ever gave to me. And I've already had it rebound twice. Okay, so yes, duct tape it is. Okay, I will get the black duct tape. There's that one of those guys. Duck dime. Okay, great, great. And there's one of those infomercials with that, that black stuff that seals everything, seal whatever. Hey, I'll just put it out of there. It'll seal it up. Lamentations 3. I love this from Jeremiah. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I mean, in the midst of all of this, this is something we can stand on. This is a platform whose moorings are deep. And how we can look at everything through the world and stand on this. And each morning when he would get up, he would then respond with verse 24. I love this. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Is God our portion? Is he really everything we need? And, and are we permitted, when we're out and about, or dealing with just life in general, or the, the anxieties that we face, or the stuff that we're going through, are we able to effectively process all of that through the right lens? Are we standing on God's word? What we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a parenthetical break over the next couple of weeks. Instead of launching into 37 through 40 of Jeremiah, we're going to look at what the New Testament says about a very similar idea of standing on the platform of God's Word. The book of Colossians had a very, very similar admonition given to them. Uh, these folks were struggling with some different issues that were coming across their way. And by the time you get to chapter 3, the Apostle Paul really admonishes this church to consider the same thing that Jeremiah had to consider, and the same things, frankly, that you and I have to consider on a regular basis. And it begins with this. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Since you've been raised to a new life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at God's right hand. Verse 2. Think about the things of heaven, not just the things of earth, for this reason. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. And then it goes on through verse 17. It gives us what we call the put off and put on principles. And we'll deal with those next week. So we'll take two Sundays in Colossians. And then we'll go back and then begin to wrap up the book of Jeremiah. So let me ask you a question. Those of you who are going to be going back to school, you middle schoolers and high schoolers, college students, who some of you are going to be going back, some of you are going online. I mean, it's going to be crazy out there. How do you view the platform upon which you stand as an opportunity to live out and share Christ with the people that you're around? Or is your platform one of the latest comments from one of our network outlets? You're so fired up and riled up because of what you see going on, and by God, that you're taking a stand. Well, good for you. Is that stand based on a proper assessment of God and his word, or just something that we get emotionally charged of? Well, that, that presses us. Now, I know you guys are this is crazy and nuts. We all have our little buttons that sometimes get pushed. You have them maybe sometimes in your home, things that you're seeing right now, whatever those are. Uh, for me, sometimes, believe it or not, uh, since I'm a weather freak, you know that, I'm not going to it all, sometimes I get, I like plan my 
like, like I'm going to mow the lawn because, hey, the rain chances are it's, it's 60% and they're coming at this time. So I, I adjust that and get the windows of the car closed and get the flowers out when we're in this situation and I'm trimming this up and I'm doing that. I got I had rungs to paint on my front deck. So, hey, we had to get that done. I get the second coat on. And I don't know what's going on with Marshall this year, but I'm telling you right now, Marshall's hard to get the drop. And I'm a little tired of it. <laughs> and it's, it's messing with me. Okay, I'm sick and tired of talking to Katie, who's living down there in New Baltimore. Hey, Dad, it's pouring down here. Send it this way. All of our friends in Delaplane. Hey, they're getting rain. Uh, Gay Mac, you guys had plenty of rain down in your house the other day. We need Zippo. And it's starting to, I mean, it's messing with me. Now, you might think, how ridiculous is that? Guess what? Some of you have some ridiculous platforms that you stand on. <laughs> There's some things that literally turn you upside down, and you know full well that you should not allow that to happen. And when those, when those things go on, you, you put the platform of God and his word over here. You just want your time. God is saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what it is. You have to be able to process things effectively and correctly all the time. We are spiritual beings in a, in a body, we're body and spirit. We're, where's Joe? Joe, you're here today, right? Joe Serverdale. He's a trichotomist. Now, don't pull him against that. Okay, he believes in body, soul, spirit. I'm just body and spirit. We love going at each other all the time. The question is, Joe, what's everybody else in here? Are they going to be on your side? Next week, what we'll do, we'll put all the trichotomists over here. And we'll put all the non over here. All right? Regardless of your position, we have a spirit and we have a body. And God wants us as spiritual beings to respond appropriately to God and his word. We, he, he's designed us to have a relationship with him. What are we doing about that? Well, this church in Colossae was challenged with the same things. And so that growing in Christ involves an ongoing effort to put Christ first no matter what, to keep loving our Savior. Now, look at what he says again. Since you've been raised to a new life with Christ. Some of your translations that you might have uh, might use the word if. Now, in the original languages, the Greek New Testament has four different if clauses, or known as conditional clauses. This is known as a first-class condition. It's an assumed reality to be true. That's why this translation, the New Living, Translated the word since. It is a reality. Since you have a relationship with God, then this is our reaction. So the question is, do we have a relationship with Jesus? Or are we just on the periphery? Hey, listen, way back in the Paleozoic age in 1980 when I graduated from high school, I mean, I was familiar with God a little bit. I mean, I went to church from time to time. But God, God was kind of out in the periphery and... It was fine, but I was living my life through a certain grid that included God from time to time, and not the other way around. My central core wasn't the Lord, and then viewing everything else on the way out, it was exactly the opposite. So as long as Christianity wasn't affecting my core, then it was fine to be a part of that. And I remember getting my world rock when I went to the University of New York for the first time, first week there, uh, going to school for meteorology, and I go into my uh, freshman in English class, the professor storms through the door, jumps on top of the desk, and starts screaming expletives at us. That we were stupid freshmen, and I, I thought, what, really, this, this is what I signed up for? I just want to learn more about the weather. I don't want to be called all kinds of crazy names. And God used that time to really what, shock me into thinking, wait a minute, what, what's really going on here? It was several years later when I trusted Christ as Savior and God changed my life. And I have to tell you, ever since that time, the Lord has been reshaping me as he's doing with all of us. So that now my world starts with him and then everything else is on the periphery. And so if you and I are going to grow in our walk with God and love our Savior the way that it's designed, we've got to do that by really embracing Jesus over everything else. And I do mean that. Embracing Jesus over everything else. It doesn't mean that the other things are not important. And, and, and just basic, trivial, uh, earthly things are not important. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that everything else compared to Jesus needs to be relatively unimportant. So in other words, our core 
is God, and then everything else flows out, and, and the way we see things flows from that, and then he tells us how to do it. Since we've been raised to this new life in Christ, and I want you to do two things. Set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, and second of all, verse 2, I want you to think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Now, some of your translations, the phrase there is, seek those things which are above. Same word that's used in Matthew 6.33, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. The word that's used here is awesome. It's known as a present imperative. It means that it's something that you and I constantly do, and it's a command that we do it. So God says, because we have a relationship, and our core starts here, and everything else on the periphery, the way that you keep that in the forefront is you keep seeking the things that are above. Keep doing it. Are we doing it? Because at times we do drop the ball. We do. It, it, it's challenging at times because we allow those push-button issues to get under our skin and mess with our spirit and really throw us a curveball. And God says, are we willing to make sure that we embrace Jesus over everything else by seeking him first? I mean, that's a strong admonition. But then he gets a little bit deeper into it in verse 2. And then he says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It's a different word. This word for seeking carries with it the idea of how we respond to the imperative with our whole heart, emotion, and actions. In other words, taking the address, yeah, 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 Lord, we'll seek you. And then God says, no, no, I want you to take it a little bit deeper. I want you to take that admonition, and I want it to affect every ounce of who you are, your mind, your emotions, and your will. I mean, this is, this is big. He understands that if we don't do that, we are easily thrown off by stuff. God says, by doing this, by, by seeking me and making that commitment, and then following this admonition, you are much more guaranteed to remain in the core and to view things correctly rather than jumping on other platforms that seem emotionally charged and that seem great. And I, I'm going to show you what this is all about. God says, wait a minute, process that through me first. And then make your decisions about those other arenas. Set your mind on things above. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, we are to love not the world, neither the things in the world. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And God says if we continue to love the world, those are the things we'll do. That will be our core and not me, and I will continuously be on the periphery. I'll be disappointed constantly. I'll be let down. God says, you put me in the center, and you watch how my sovereignty works. And you know what? Even when you're not doing well, I will give you the peace of God that passes all understanding because you're filtering it through the right grid. What a difference. I am telling you what a difference it makes in this world. You do it for your jobs. You do it when you're in school. Those of you, you're going back to school. How can God use you right now with this? Because I guarantee you, some of your friends, they're all, they're all messed up. Or they're anxious. Or they don't maybe know who to talk to. Or they're confused about stuff. Or they're filtering things. And they're, man, they are charged up on certain things. How can you bring a spirit of calm, direction, and clarity to what's going on by God using you in the midst of all of this? Many of you going back to college, same thing. How can God use you? Those of you going back to work, those of you who are retired, some of you are retired and you're thinking, oh my Lord, where's, all my stuff is going away. My 401k, what's going to happen with the stock market? Well, I mean, my Lord, if Trump gets elected, what's going to happen? But if Biden gets elected, guess what? Let God be your filter for all of that. And we can if we seek him first and we set our minds on things above. And I'm telling you, he just he brings a calm. He allows us to process in the next couple of weeks, we're going to break out then that, the, the reasons for all of this. He says in verse 3, For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ. Ooh, really? What does that mean? And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you're going to share in all of his glory. Verse 5, put to death your sinful earthly things that are working within you. Oh, we are going to unpack 
this whole idea of putting on and putting off what God has so that we can be the most effective ministers for Christ and embracing him and the love of Christ in our life. So what's the platform we're standing on? What is it? Whatever that is, allow it to be sifted and put through and placed on the periphery unless it's God's word first. And take a step back and let's allow ourselves to embrace the sovereignty and love of Christ to affect our decision and change our life and bring glory to his name. Let's stand as we close out. And uh, Joe, you can bring the team. Lord, we are really grateful to be here today. Thank you for loving us. Help us to be on that platform of your word. Help us to see things effectively and correctly. And uh, realizing, Lord, that there's so many other things that are going on in this life, but they need to be viewed through your lens and not the other way around. We thank you for this church, the Colossian Church. And we praise you, Lord, for the admonitions that they were given. I pray that we would take it to heart, that we would embrace the seeking you and the setting our minds on you and to loving you first and foremost above all things. We ask for this help. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. website for all the information about how we're doing services, whether we're inside or whether we're outside. We'll look forward to seeing you guys next weekend. Enjoy the rest of your day.